Ladies and gentlemen, we gather in observance of Patriot Day 2013 and the events of September 11, 2001. Here to open our program is the chairman of the Onslow Civic Affairs Committee, Dr. Don Herring. Good morning. Welcome to this observance hosted by the Onslow Civic Affairs Committee on behalf of our community. The Jacksonville, Onslow, Lejeune, and North New River community has a significant tie to the events of September 11, 2001, and the designation of this annual observance as Patriot Day. Just a few hundred feet from here is the Beirut Memorial. It reminds us of another terrorist event 30 years ago next month that many agree was part of an opening salvo in a series of events that continue to this day. Our purpose here today is not to debate history or politics, but to remember those who perished as a result of the events of 9-11 and those who continue to be involved. We will do that by presenting the memories of family members, survivors, and friends of those who died as a result of that day. Members and friends of the Onslow Civic Affairs Committee, as well as community members, will stand as representatives of those who perished. We are honored this year to have two persons who were survivors of these events. One was a New York police officer, the other a Marine officer stationed at the Pentagon. While they and other participants might stand in for a specific person, our intent is to rep represent all those who were affected by the events of 12 years ago today and to give special remembrance to those who have passed as a result of that day. Members of the Civic Affairs Committee selected this location because of this I-beam of steel that resides behind me. 12 years ago, at this very moment, it was part of a structure that held strong the World Trade Center. On July 4th, 2003, it was presented to the Marines and sailors of our area in honor of the 343 firefighters who gave their lives for others. As one of the first beams ever given to others, it was an honor to the Marines to be the first in the efforts of the battlefields and in response to the events of this day 12 years ago. It stands today as witness to this community's resolve to remember that day, to remember the sacrifices made then and which continue to be made as a result of that day. Just as we stand in this memorial today, you who are here or watching or who are part of this observance are also part of this remembrance of those who have perished as a result of the events of September 11, 2001. Please rise for the invocation by Civic Affairs Committee member Oliver Hill, the presentation of the colors by the Jacksonville Fire Department Honor Guard, and after the national anthem by the 2nd Marine B Division Band, please join Jacksonville Youth, Ch Youth Council Chairman Ray Ann Heap in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please bow your heads for the prayer. Good morning. Almighty God, in homes perfect kingdom, no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love. Let us pray that action on 9-11 that brought us here are never repeated. That you, might, that you mightly spread abroad your spirit, that all people may be gathered under the banner of peace. Lord, we request your blessing upon this observance. We pray that those who stand to represent victims worthily portray our honor for their sacrifice. And we pray that we hold their lives as a call for peace in our earthly world. In your name we pray, amen, amen, amen. March on the Colors.
Would you please join in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may now be seated. As we reflect on the events of September 11, 2001, the Onslow Civic Affairs Committee and others will stand in to remember some of the victims selected from each of the five venues affected by that day. They were not individual targets on 9-11, but randomly selected victims. We will also draw from the large pool of those who have lost their lives in planes, in the World Trade Center, in the Pentagon, as a first responder, or those who continue to lose their lives as a military responder to the events of that day. Our first group this morning represents the unsuspecting passengers who boarded four separate flights that morning. Betty Ann Ong. Betty was a flight attendant on American Airlines Flight 11, the first hijacked airplane on September 11th. Betty took immediate action, notifying the ground crew of the hijacking situation on board the aircraft. And during this horrific ordeal, she stayed on the telephone relaying vital information that eventually led to the closing of airspace by the FAA for the first time in United States history. Betty loved working with children and was surrounded by many friends. Although she was shy when she was younger, Betty took an interest in sports, and it is in sports that she excelled and flourished. Her sports interests turned into passion, and it was sports that helped her grow and embrace the ideals of team spirit. She learned that when people share the same vision, they will be successful. She believed that hard work builds character and strength of mind and can overcome obstacles. Betty was a positive person and carried with her a can-do attitude each day. Betty Ann gave her life helping others aboard Flight 11 and is forever remembered by friends and loved ones as truly heroic. David Angel and Lynn Edwards Angel. David and his wife Lynn had just celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary in 2001. David was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and graduated from Providence College, and later reserve, received an honorary doctorate degree. He served in the US Army and at the Pentagon. Lynn was born in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, and attended Auburn University, which prepared her for an early career as a librarian. The couple met while working in Cape Cod. And although both were writers at heart, Lynn worked as a librarian, and David as an insurance technical writer. But then they took a leap of faith and moved to Hollywood where five years of hard work provided the break that they were looking for. David got his first break writing an episode for the sitcom Cheers and won an Emmy for his efforts. He went on to write for other TV series including Wings and Frasier. Lynn continued her career as a librarian which she enjoyed very much. David and Lynn were known to friends and loved ones as kind and gentle. Both had a great sense of humor as well. They were a devoted couple, and theirs was a journey of joy, kindness, and gentleness, a journey that ended much too quickly. They were also on American, Flights 11, American Airlines Flight 11 on September 11, 2001. Myra Joy Aronson. 
Myra was a public relations manager for CompuCore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. She was a longtime Boston resident and was on her way to Palm Springs, California for a business conference along with her coworker, Graham. Ironically enough, Myra was on American Airlines Flight 11, while Graham was aboard United Airlines Flight 175. Both Myra and Graham died in the terrorist attacks that day. Myra's friend Pamela said that Myra was a wonderful friend and someone who was looking forward to the rest of her life. She was born in Illinois and graduated from Miami University with a bachelor's degree in French, and she spent time studying in France, where her, the love for, for that country and language cuisine flourished. She continued her education and received a master's degree in communications at Boston University. Myra worked as a public relations consultant to many companies in the Boston area and taught public relations at Emerson College. Family and friends de describe her as bright, athletic, and health conscious. Myra worked out four or five times a week. She was an incredibly bright woman on top of her game in public relations, said her friend Pamela. She was a wonderful person, and I'm going to miss her terribly. Ladies and gentlemen, the Second Marine Division Band.
Our second group this morning represents victims from the World Trade Center. Marie Rose Abad. Marie was 49 when her life was cut short in the South Tower. She was born in Greenpoint section of Brooklyn and raised in Richmond Hill, Queens. She was a very bright, pleasant, and giving person who was always willing to lend an ear, Rudy, her wife said, Rudy said of his wife. We were really best friends, he said. Rudy's world collapsed when the twin, twin towers fell, burying his wife, Marie, and the couple's plans to retire early and travel the world. It took a while for Rudy to face his devastating loss. It, he was feeling like he was getting paid for her death when he was red, and was reticent to claim his family's share of the victim's compensation fund. But through his mourning, though, he did accept compensation and used it for something that would give Marie's memory meaning. He created a fund in Marie's name to help others who are experiencing hardship and partnered with a nonprofit to build housing for homeless families in his native country, the Philippines. Other families of 9-11 victims have launched similar, similar charitable ventures, ranging from full-fledged foundations to scholarships and donations to the victims of natural disasters. The Marie Rose Abad Village in Tondo, Manila, comprises three clusters of 46 brightly colored row houses and a two-unit schoolhouse for preschoolers. And at last count, all of the houses have been completed and have families living in them. Paul Aquaviva. Paul's father said his 29-year-old son was a down-to-earth guy on top of the world. Paul was a wide receiver who played on the state champion football team in Wayne, New Jersey. He had only one wrong answer on his SAT and was inducted into the Phi Beta Kappa at Rutgers University. He landed a job out of Columbia University Law School with one of the top law firms in New York City. Paul's father said he was a smart kid, but he never showed it. He never bragged. He was just the person everyone was comfortable with. And when Paul was looked at something, you were sure it was the way to go. He analyzed everything. On September 11, Paul was working on the 103rd floor of the World Trade Center's North Tower when the first plane hit. The following October, he would have celebrated his 30th birthday with his wife, Courtney, and their two-year-old daughter, Sarah. His wife was going to deliver the couple's second child, a boy which she delivered in December a few months after Paul died in the terrorist attacks. Jacqueline Aldridge. Jacqueline was from Staten Island, New York. <clears throat> she was petite and had a slow gait that neighbors and friends were used to seeing. They also knew Jacqueline as a direct and strong presence. She loved to travel, combining her journeys with visits to family. Germany and Barbados were favorite destinations, and she and her husband often went to the Poconos Resort where she could indulge in her favorite passion, shopping. She hosted her sister's children, Abba and Kwame, for summer vacations in New York, and went to visit them in Atlanta at Christmas time. She was so genuinely a good person, always ready to do something without asking for anything, said her older sister. On September 11, 2001, Jacqueline went to her office on the 98th floor of Tower One, where she worked for three years in the finance department of Martian McClellan. Her husband, Lafayette, was hopeful that she would come home and waited as he watched the news of the tragic event. Jacqueline had an enormous figure for one of such small stature, he said. She had a Napoleonic spirit that could never be controlled. Jacqueline's rema Jacqueline remains among the thousands still missing in the attack on the World Trade Center.
to thee I will be. Our third group represents victims from the Pentagon. Peggy Hurt. Peggy had been on the job at the Pentagon only two weeks in September 11, 2001. Her position in the Army's accounting section, which followed a stint with the National Guard, was a promotion the Virginia State University Honors gra graduate had eagerly sought. She was excited to move on, said Dolores, her cousin. The 36-year-old native of Cambridge, Virginia, lived in Springfield. She moved to Washington a few years before from Richmond, where she had also held a government accounting position. Not too far away, she often returned to visit her many friends and family in that part of the state. She was definitely a people person, a friend said. Peggy was blessed musically as well, and with cousins and other relatives. She was a member of the Hurt Family Gospel Singing Group. Her favorite song was, The Battle Is Not Yours, It's the Lord's. And with her voice, she could always lead. May God get the glory for the great things she has done, said her father, Harris. 
On the eve of September 11, Peggy and longtime family friend Phyllis Adams took Peggy, Peggy's godmother to dinner for her 86th birthday. They had a grand time and stayed out too late for a work night, so Phyllis asked Peggy to give her a wake-up call that next Tuesday. She phoned about 6.45 a.m. in the morning, and the two women talked briefly, and then they hung up to get ready for work. Captain Jack Punches. Jack was a native of Tower Hill, Illinois, and held a bachelor's from Missouri University in civil engineering, a master's in strategic studies from the Naval War College, and a master's in international relations as well. He was designated a naval aviator in 1975 and completed three deployments before reporting as an instructor pilot in Jacksonville, Florida. During his military career, Jack was also assigned to Patrol Squadron 49 VP-49, Joining the lift, he joined the Lifting Eagles of Fleet Logistics Support Squadron as the chief, chief executive officer and assumed command of VR-24 in 1991, which deployed to Saudi Arabia in support of Operations Desert Storm, Desert Shield. In 1995, Jack proceeded to the office of Chief of Naval Operations under the Secretary of the Navy for counter-drug matters at the Pentagon. He then served as Deputy Director of the Operations and in an Interagency Support Division before retiring from the Navy. After retirement, he returned to the Navy as a senior civilian employee at the Pentagon. His favorite pastime after retirement was golfing with his son Jeremy and helping his daughter Jennifer set up their, her very first apartment. In the Navy, Jack accumulated more than 7,000 flight hours and 50 career landings. He was awarded many times with many commendations and service medals. Willie Q. Troy. Willie has voicemail messages he will never retrieve. Family members and friends frantically tried to contact him by cell phone as news of the attack on the Pentagon became widely publicized. Willie was born the fifth of six children, Bessie, May, and John Troy in Delco, North to, 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 to Bessie, May, and John Troy in Delco, North Carolina. He was active in the school band and was able to play various instruments with minimal instruction. His talent so impressed the band leader that he would frequently ask Willie to teach the class. <clears throat> After graduating from West Columbus High School, he moved to Washington, D.C. and was drafted by the U.S. Army in 1970. He served in Vietnam as a guard to General Abrams. And although he was wounded during the course of his tour, he stayed in Vietnam until his assignment was completed. While in Vietnam, Willie and his childhood sweetheart, Judy, wrote letters to each other daily. They were married three days after he returned to North Carolina. The family was stationed in New Mexico, where their daughter, Renee, was born. And after New, ne New Mexico, Willie was stationed at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. His appearance was always impeccable, reflecting his pride at working at the nerve center of the military. His coworkers described him as knowledgeable and one of the smartest people they had ever met. Willie enjoyed fishing and cooking big dimmer dinners for his extremely large family. He would laugh and joke with them until early hours of the morning. The events of September 11, 2001 changed that forever. He is now missed by all of those lives that he has touched. Jacksonville Youth Council Vice Chairman Elizabeth Nolan of White Oak High School. Please rise and bow your heads. I offer this prayer. Twelve years ago, at this moment, we as a nation were unable to ponder what this meant. At this point in time, we still grieve and still search for meeting, for comfort, and for our mission. I pray to you, my Lord, that grief does not overwhelm us, that these deaths of these citizens randomly selected, specifically targeted, and whose families, friends, loved ones, and associates are missed greatly are not without meaning. I pray to you, my Lord, that you provide comfort, that all know of your grace, 
your forgiveness, your mercy, and your compassion. I pray to you, my Lord, that your mission becomes clear, that we stand here today remembering what happened 12 years ago is part of that mission, that we endure, prosper, and carry forth is part of that mission, that we embrace each other's diversity, difference, and sameness, that we celebrate our commonness as Americans, as citizens of the world, and as human beings. I pray to you, my Lord, that my generation accepts this mantle of responsibility, that we come to know the great mission that you provide for us. I pray to you, my Lord, that we cause others to gather at this site and sites like this annually, that we remember what happened. And dear Lord, I pray for guidance. This I pray on this day and this location at this time in order to, mem to memorialize those we are so sadly remembered and those who have been lost. Amen. You may be seated.
At this moment, on September 11, 2001, the first hijacked plane crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Please join us in a moment of silence as we reflect on this moment, which has forever changed our lives. These sirens represent the response of brave law enforcement, firefighters, and rescue personnel who responded on that day to the World Trade Centers, the Pentagon, and to the field in Pennsylvania where one of the planes crashed. Standing before you are members of our community who also willingly risk their lives to save others. They now help share stories of some of the fallen first responders of that fateful day. Calixto Anaya Jr. Calixto, everyone knew Calixto as Charlie. Charlie was a New York City firefighter. His wife, Marie, said he was very attentive to the little things and that he loved to keep love alive, whether it was taking days off for activities with their three children or showing up with flowers when she did not expect them. Charlie always wanted to do things the right way, Marie said. When they were married in 1990 in a simple civil service, Charlie insisted that they begin saving for the big church wedding her parents could not afford. Six months later, they marched down the aisle <coughs> of St. St. Rita's Roman Catholic Church in Brooklyn. Charlie was a former active duty Marine who re-enlisted when the Persian Gulf War broke out in 1991. He believed that true patriotism meant flying the American flag, not only in front of their home, but also wherever the family came to rest on camping trips or jaunts to the beach. Charlie loved the New York Yankees baseball team and was a fan of the New York Giants football team. He preserved the hole he punched in the basement ceiling while celebrating the Yankees World Series victory over the Mets in 2008. Charlie was just 35 when he died helping others at the World Trade Centers on September 11, 2001. Terrell Coleman. <clears throat> Firefighter Terrell Coleman's friends and co-workers and football teammates called him Prozac, not because he took the mood balancing drug, but because he sometimes needed to just calm down a little bit. Terrell was full of energy and full of life. While many people have a childhood story involving matches, Terrell's past was probably an indication that he was to become a firefighter. At five years of age, he stuck his head into the incinerator in his family's apartment building in Queens. Terrell's brother, John, who is also a firefighter, remembers, we didn't notice anything until we got upstairs and saw that he had no eyebrows, no eyelashes, and no hairline. <laughs> Terrell's chattiness and high-strung curiosity was contagious, and his family and friends were charmed. Whenever he prepared a lasagna dinner for his mother, Laurel, in her Jamaica Queens home, she would just watch her son patiently with her head propped in her hand. You just couldn't stop him, she said. You just had to sit there and watch and listen. Terrell was 32 years old in 2001 and carried his passionate nature onto the ball field. His teammates knew that they had a good player that would just not quit and would put all his effort into the game. His flame was extinguished during terrorist attacks, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center.
Mark J. Ellis. Mark always dreamed of becoming a police officer, and at age five, he played cops and robbers with a set of plastic handcuffs and a notepad that he used to write speeding tickets with. As he grew older, it became apparent that he had developed an affinity for the straight and narrow path. And as a teenager, Mark lectured his older sister about getting speeding tickets, rarely went to parties, and never drank alcohol because he liked to stay in control. He did not fear from, veer from his goal, and Mark became a police officer for the New York's police department. His character was legendary there. You just couldn't get him to do anything wrong, said fellow co-officer Eric Semler, Officer Ellis's partner for three years. He might bend a rule now and then, but he would never break a rule. Officer Ellis, 26, who lived with his parents in Huntington Station, New York, did take risks, though. He was an avid outdoorsman and enjoyed activities like boating, mountain biking, and snowboarding. And having realized his dream of becoming a police officer, he also set new goals. He was making plans to marry his longtime girlfriend, Stephanie. And he had also applied for jobs with the Secret Service and the FBI. After Mark's death, his parents received acceptance letters from both agencies. I was home from work because of sickness that day, and I was watching one of the morning shows, and then they got word that a plane had flown into one of the towers at the Royal Trade Center. Then we were getting word about a plane going into the Pentagon. A lot sticks out of my mind that day because our daughter lived in Northern Virginia. Well, immediately we got concerned because she was so close to the Pentagon. And that day had a hard effect on her. It took her months to be comfortable about going to work and when she saw planes outside. I was working at a small manufacturer outside of Minneapolis and I was just standing at a desk talking to a guy and somebody else came up and said, did you hear a plane hit the World Trade Center? And at that time, everybody thought it was a, a, an airline accident. And then of course it wasn't too much longer that the second plane hit and then everyone realized there was more to it than that. Minneapolis is not a big military town, but there are many bridges that go over the interstates and people from the National Guard and Reserves actually went out that day and stood out there at attention saluting as people drove by underneath and I just thought that was the the neatest most patriotic thing I've ever seen. I was on the phone with my mom we were both watching the same morning um, news show and um, when I looked up at the screen and I noticed a plane that was a little close to the buildings she asked me what why I had stopped talking and I said, look at the screen, and that's when the plane hit immediately. The base that I lived on with my husband went into immediate lockdown. It was scary, knowing that something like that could happen on U.S. soil. Good morning. My name is Russ Jamison. I served over 26 years in the United States Marine Corps. I'm honored to have a moment to share some words with you, and I appreciate your patience. On 11 September 2001, I was an active duty lieutenant colonel serving at Plans, Policies, and Operations Department, Headquarters Marine Corps in the Pentagon. My office was in 4A 472, which is the same corridor that American Flight 77 hit, although my office was on the fourth floor on the innermost ring. This morning you are participating in a very special ceremony, a very special tradition, a tradition of pride in who we are as Americans. You've come to remember this day at this steel beam that represents a final resting place for those who were lost or gave their lives in New York City, at the Pentagon in Arlington, and in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. As Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, once said, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Fitting and proper because this is our duty. This is our first duty to remember. And part of remembering is to translate what happened then into what we face today. I remember having to get up early that morning to brief some general officers. On the drive in, coming down the scenic George Washington Parkway, that traces along the Potomac River as it goes into, flows into Washington, D.C. I note a calm, cool day 
with clear blue sky and a beautiful sunrise, a day that started so peaceful, just like today. I remember finishing my brief, returning to my workstation, and I receive a call from all people, my florist here in Jacksonville, North Carolina. She tells me a terrible thing has happened to the North Tower of the World Trade Center, that an aircraft has hit a building. And I think to myself, this has to be an accident, because who on earth would do such a thing on purpose? I remember Flight 77 is a Boeing 757. It was traveling 502 miles per hour, carrying over 10,000 gallons of high-octane jet fuel. It crashes into the western side of the Pentagon at 9.37 and 46 seconds, killing 53 passengers, the six crew members, and, of course, the high, five hijackers. The plane hits the ground on the E-ring between the fourth and fifth corridors, and at the moment of impact, it skips in with its right wing elevated. The front part of the fuselage disintegrates on impact. The mid and tail sections penetrate a fraction of a second more with the landing gear debris penetrating into almost the innermost ring. The Navy Operations Center, offices of the Army Administrative Assistance, and the Defense Intelligence Agency are obliterated, killing over 125. In all, the airplane took eight-tenths of a second to travel 310 feet into the Pentagon through four rings and unleashes a fireball that rises 200 feet above the building. I remember feeling the plane hit the building. I remember the sound of the explosion. Everyone begins to evacuate the building, take care of those around them, and to assist in any way that we can. There is no panic, no cowardice, no selfishness. All I see that day is calm determination in individual acts of courage and selfless teamwork all day. I remember helping in any way we could. Accountability of the members of our work section, allowing folks to use my cell phone until cellular service has been interrupted. Searching for those who need help eventually gives way to recovery. I remember during the morning, the control tower at Reagan National Airport radios to the first responders on the scene a report of unidentified aircraft in the area. The incident commander orders us across Washington Boulevard about 100 yards away from the building. Some of us crouch behind jersey barriers. Others cross over a low stone wall that borders Arlington National Cemetery. Think of this. Those others are protected by the headstones in Section 69. And I'm struck by the irony and the rightness that our honored fallen are still protecting her nation's citizens. I remember how hot the inferno burned, and I remember the smells of jet fuel, burned materials, and scorched others. It's funny how the smells only come back this time of year. I recall seeing aircraft rescue firefighter crews from Reagan National arriving with a foam unit. That was a game changer, you see because pouring water on burning hot, high-octane jet fuel just makes the problem worse and spreads the fuel. They dump enough aqueous film in the first seven minutes to knock down the fire, allowing time for self-evacuation, saving many lives, and eventually the building. I remember the sound of the outside wall collapsing 33 minutes after the attack. We then see overhead and we hear the screams of United States Air Force F-15 fighter jets from Langley Air Force Base. And I look up and I think, thank God, we have somebody in Overwatch. Nothing's going to get through those guys. I remember manning the litter team, helping injured into an ambulance, helping supply bottled water to the Arlington firefighters, helping set up tents brought by the Reagan National Airport and the Dulles Airport mass casualty units. We later assist the FBI evidence collection team in identifying parts lying on the ground outside the impact area, not just parts from the airplane. I find a woman's shoe. I remember feeling vitriol and hate for the cowards that caused all this. As an active duty Marine, I'm ready to do my duty and to go take some names. A reporter comes up to me and puts a microphone in my face 
and asks, how do I feel? That's not a good question to ask. It shouldn't be one to ever ask. My response is not usable on the evening broadcast that night due to the number of cuss words and expletives that I use. I remember finally being able to call out on a payphone located in a nearby gas station. You should know that in an emergency, a lot of people will be using their cell phones and you will not be able to connect a call. I can't dial long distance. The local circuits are all overloaded. I try a local call to my parents living in Fairfax. I get through. I'll never forget the sound of my father or the fact that my mom couldn't talk to me. We get cut off before I could tell him I loved him one last time. I remember at the time of the attack, there was 18,000 people in the Pentagon, which is 4,000 people fewer than there should have been. You see, that section of the building hit had just been renovated, had the most up-to-date fire protection system, steel reinforced walls, blast resistant windows, smoke curtains. 2,000 people are scheduled for Thursday of that week to move into those offices that were unoccupied when hit by Flight 77. The Pentagon Daycare Center, with over 200 children, is on the exact opposite side of the building and therefore the farthest away from impact. God truly is control because the loss of life, although tragic, could have been much, much higher. So now what? I just gave you 12 I remembers. Every year I add one to my list and I suggest you do the same and to please share it with others. Let me tell you again why it's so important to remember. I quoted earlier Abraham Lincoln, I'll quote him again. A nation with little regard for its past will do little worth remembering in the future. And this is our duty. Our first duty is to remember, to translate what happened then into what we face today. And to that end, I remember so that I may be vigilant, prepared, and selfless. When I look back on that day, I could see the pain endured, the mistakes that were made, and the suffering that, were, that was taught, taken. When I look at us now, I see how strong we've become, the lessons that have been learned, and I take great pride in who we are. Alive through the power and grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, if you remember one thing from my talk this morning, please let it be it, this. Patriotism and remembering is not so much protecting the land of our fathers as it is preserving this land for our children. Thank you, Semper Fidelis. Now the North Side Singers sing America the Beautiful.
With the nation in turmoil over the events of September 11, our military personnel were ready and willing to be called into action. Many here today have risked their lives in this war on terror, and to each of you, we are forever indebted. In our fifth tableau, at the memorial this morning are representatives from area military installations, and we will share the stories of some of the brave men and women who have fallen in the continuing war on terror. Army Sergeant Devin C. Posh. The 25-year-old Devin of our city, Jacksonville, was assigned to the Special Troops Battalion, 3rd Brigade, 25th Infantry Division at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. Devin was a great fan of weightlifting. He posted to the blog bodybuilding.com in December saying, weightlifting is a passion. And after his death, an army friend and fellow body bodybuilder posted on his personal blog, lift in peace, posh, you can rest between sets. Devin joined the army in February of 2005. Dixie Pickett, a friend, said he was someone she had grown to love as her own son. He helped me out when I needed someone to help me during the hardship in my life, she said. He was loving like a son. Devin is survived by his mother, Sandra, and his father, Kevin. He died March 31, 2009, during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Marine Staff Sergeant Eric D. Christian. Eric was more than a Marine. He was a man who embodied compassion and integrity, lived in a place of truth and realness, and believed in making life exactly what he wanted it to be. His family remembers him as fearless and adventurous, and at the same time, a very private and vulnerable person. As a giver, he embodied compassion and integrity. Eric was the son of Linda and Robert Christian. Family and friends remember Eric for many things, but among them, that Eric was a hero to our beloved country. He was killed in Afghanistan on Saturday, May 4, not 2013. He was an independent thinker, and he accepted everything for what it was and everyone for who they are. Although his faith was tested tremendously because of his career, spiritually, he was accepting and comfortable with the divine order of his life. His parents said, we will remember you as you were a noble man. Marine Corporal David Sanka. David was 23 and from Parker, Colorado. David was a multi-purpose canine handler stationed here at Camp Lejeune and was killed in action alongside his multi-purpose canine flex. David was born on November 28, 1989 in Aurora, Colorado and graduated from high school right after that. After graduating, David fulfilled his lifelong dream by enlisting with the Marine Corps. He attended boot camp in San Diego and graduated in 2008. And right after that, he wed his high school sweetheart, Tori, the following year. David was well known for his dedicated work ethic and humility, both in the canine community and in all aspects of his life. Off duty, he enjoyed spending time barbecuing with family and friends, time with his dogs, running, camping, fishing, and hunting, all in hand with his wife, Tori. David served two combat tours in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He received many honors for his service to his country, including a Purple Heart, a Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, Combat Action Ribbon, and many, many more. He was killed in action on May 4th of this year while conducting combat operations in the province of Afghanistan.
Please stand as we give honor to recognize all who have lost their lives in this war on terror. For Army Sergeant Devin C. Posh, for Marine Staff Sergeant Eric D. Christian, for Marine Corporal David M. Sonka, and for all who we have not called individually by name, we do give honor. And at this very moment, brave members of our military are risking their lives for our freedom. To all of these brave men and women, as well as to their families, we say thank you and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacksonville Fire Captain Jeff Williams. Pardon me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, once again, as we pause to remember those who were perished that day, Lord, help us realize that they're not just pictures on a placard, Lord, but they're individuals with families and friends and mothers and fathers, wives and husbands and children, Lord. So we pray for them specifically, Lord, that you would be with them as I know they pause to reflect, Lord, on that day that you'll remind them of the good times they had, Lord, and that they could look back with joy at their, at their family and the lost loved one, Lord. And I pray for the first responders, the firefighters, police, paramedics, all those involved, Lord, that you would be with them, Lord, and help us as firefighters to be determined to show that same sense of duty and determination, Lord, that they possessed. And, Lord, for the Marines and sailors here, I pray that you'll be with each one of them, Lord, and protect them and help them to know that they're cared for in this community, Lord. For those who've already given their lives, Lord, help their names be remembered with honor. And help, I pray for the city, Lord, that you'll be with us to never forget that we'll always carry on this tradition, Lord, and that those lost and those who continue, Lord, will not be forgotten. And most of all, Lord, just comfort the pain that they feel. <clears throat> for I know that you felt the same, Lord, when you gave your own son for us. Thank you so much, Lord. Just be with the older veterans here. Help them be examples to the young men that are here, the Marines and sailors, Lord. Thank you so much for this city. Just bless us all and help us bring honor to you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, our purpose today has to been to remember those who died as a result of the attacks on September 11, 2001, and the resulting actions. We thank you for pausing to remember. Those who stood before us today were merely, merely representatives of those who perished. We thank them and you for your participation in this remembrance. Tragedies have a way of unifying us. They help us to see that we stand on common ground. Despite the horrific suffering on that day 12 years ago, there has come a great outpouring of pride and strength in our country. The pride brought unity, nationalism, and spirit. The strength has brought resolve, compassion, and action. A show of unity was exemplified by the members of Congress when they were gathered on the steps of the Capitol and they spontaneously sang, God bless America. Please let us stay standing now united as we all sing together, God bless America with the Northside Choir. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam god bless america my home, sweet home, God bless America, my home, sweet home. Please remain standing for the retirement of the colors. This concludes the 2013 observant of observance of the events of September 11, 2001. The Onslow Civic Affairs Committee urges you to reflect on this day and the sacrifices that continue to be made. Ladies and gentlemen, you are cordially invited to visit and touch the 9-11 memorial. Remember those who have died in service to our country and who perished 12 years ago today. Thank you for attending this observance.